Shalom, B'Shem Hashem, Na'aseh V'Nasliyah. So we're picking up where we left off. We kind of um, had to last shiur, we had to kind of go back a little bit in the Ikar Shishi, in the sixth principle of Teshuvah. For those of you that are joining us tonight, um, we are in a sefer, uh, in the sefer Sha'are Teshuvah, the gates of repentance, that basically is one of the masterpieces that are for us to use today by Rabbeinu Yonah that teach us the importance of doing teshuvah, the importance of repenting, and also at the same time, repentance, is, repentance itself revolves around changing our path in life, and in doing so, bettering ourselves. So really it's three birds with one stone. Not only do we learn the how-tos of how to become better people, but we also we learn the technicalities of what it takes to do teshuvah, what it takes to repent. Today, we see maybe teshuvah repenting as, okay, I'll go to, uh, I'll go to synagogue or some of for others, I'll go to temple, <laughs> uh, I'll go to temple on Yom Kippur, and I'll fast all day, and I'll be in a really bad mood the entire day, and then God will somehow miraculously forgive me for all of my sins from birth until now, and then tonight I'll pig out again and be the same person that I was 27 hours ago. So that's not what we're discussing here. What we're doing, the, the, the Rabbeinu Yonah is teaching us how to live life in a constant state of repentance, in a good way, meaning perfecting our life every single day, step at a time, knowing how to truly do it. So we're, we're going chapter by chapter. We're still in the first gate, the first chapter, believe it or not. Um, it's a very intense book. Um, and we are in, last week we finished, finally, um, the sixth principle. Now we are in the seventh. We're starting the seventh principle um, in the first chapter. So, last week the principle that we talked about was busha. I'm not even going to ask if you remember. I don't want to be embarrassed. The last week's principle was busha, embarrassment, shame. And the importance of a person having embarrassment, having shame for things that are already done, which we mentioned. A lot of times today, the message out there is, listen, what's done is done, bro. It's an experience, you learn from it, and you move on. You know, it's like, woohoo, you know, everything, I'm, I'm proud of everything I did in life. Everything was an experience and a learning thing, and I'm, ne I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to look back. And all the experience that I've had, all the people that I've hurt, just made me who I am. You know, that's how we go to sleep at night. But the Sha'ara Teshuvah is telling us that that's not how it is. Busha is important. We have to be ashamed. We have to be embarrassed. We should feel shame about the mistakes that we've made because that's a part of the process of change. If you don't have shame for old mistakes, you're not fully changed until you do so. It's like an alcoholic anonymous, you know? You go to the AA meeting, you know, imagine the guy gets up in the AA meeting and goes, you know, um, you know, the first principle is admitting, the, right, for drug abuse and stuff, the first principle is admitting you have a drug problem, right? Or admitting you are an alcoholic. You getting up and going, hey, my name is um, Jason, and um, I've been sober for about seven minutes. I don't really know why I'm here. You know, right there, you'll know this guy's not going anywhere because he really doesn't admit that he has a problem, right? That's ikara shishi, ikara shivi. The next step for perfecting ourselves in this in this stage is hakinia becholev. In general, kinia in Hebrew means submissiveness. And it's truly, if you really think about it, the entire psychology of, of any AA program, any drug program, any alcoholic anonymous program, all these things, if you really think about it, really revolve around some of the ideas of teshuvah, of repentance. Uh, I, I, I knew a guy, actually, that used to teach. He, he, he opened a, um, a sober home. And he used to teach through books of Musar like this one, the ideas of becoming sober. 
Because truly, that's what it is. You have to accept that there is a higher power than you. You're not the highest power. You have to accept that you have a problem. Here too, hakiniyah b'cholev means complete submissiveness. Bashfilut, and feeling low. A person has to bring themselves to really feel, I am zero. I don't count. In comparison to Hashem, the greatness of God, the greatness of who He is, I am, I, I'm just a speck of dust. Because a person that really recognize, recognizes a higher power, a person that really recognizes their God, really understand how awful it is when a person really sins against God. Really recognizes how bad it is. Like, who am I to have done this wrong? I'm a nothing. Already I'm a nothing. I have nothing to give from myself, and, 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 and on top of that, I've gone ahead and spat in the face of my Creator. Or it's, like, it's like, you know, you're living free, in a free country, um, you don't pay any taxes, you don't pay your dues, nothing, you walk, by the, you walk by the palace of the king and you spray paint on his wall. And when you're caught, the king starts looking through your, you know, record, and he says, look, I would have been ready to look over all this stuff, but at the same time, I look at it, and I'm like, you don't pay any taxes. You don't pay your dues. You're in a free home. You don't pay nothing. And you come and spray paint my wall? What's wrong with you? You already have nothing. I'm providing everything you have. You've been taking money from the government. You've been taking money from me. All of that you've been taking... And at the same time, you come and you're trying to destroy my house. That's our lives, everyday life. We breathe every day, we walk, we see, we learn, we understand, we have communication with other people, we can talk, right? We get everything from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. what do we have to give back? Not much. Therefore, we really need to feel that. We really need to feel, listen, I honestly have nothing. I'm a nobody. And now, don't worry, I know what everybody's thinking, we'll, we'll get to that. And everyone's thinking like, okay, so, okay, so Rabbi Sakai is saying, I should walk around all day with my hand on my head going, oh, I am nothing, chuck, you know. We're not, we're not doing that. So, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that as well. But for now, l'chaim, everybody. <clears throat> Like it says in Tehillim, David HaMelech, which we've spoken about so many times, he says in Tehillim, A person, in his own eyes, in your own eyes, you have to be like uh, lowly. Like as if you're like, you're nothing. We'll discuss that. And other Pasukim also that talk about a person really looking at themselves and feeling shfelut, um, feeling lowliness. And we have to understand something. In many of the books, in many holy books, God is referred to as Kadosh, Marom, Ramvenisa. All these are amplified to the hundredth power. God is great, God is on high, God is all powerful, but at the same time, this powerful God, it's off now, you can just, it's off. This, this, this heavenly God, so great, all powerful, is, is down here with us, every single one of us, that's where He wants to be. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to have a relationship with us, with us lowly beings here, which, which really gives credit, you know, if you think like it. Not credit, but logically understand what I'm trying to say here. Uh, philosophers thousands of years ago, this was their issue. Right? Their entire issue with, with the existence of a God was this mentality here. Philosophers of thousands of years ago were not people that were stupid. They weren't outright, they weren't outright telling people, there's no God. What, are you, what God? What are you talking about? There is no God. That's not what they said at all. Why do you think Greek mythology and the Greeks and the Romans had all these different gods and goddesses? 
God of the ocean, God of air, God of, I don't know, bugs, <laughs> God of sun. I don't know what gods they had. They had all these different gods. So you have to think to yourself, like, okay, so they believed in all these multiple gods. What, what about the God? I mean, what was so hard about just believing in Hashem? If you're going to believe in all these things, what was the problem? Here's the problem. This was the problem. They were saying, the Almighty God, He's Ram Venisa, Gadol Venora, Kadosh, He's holy, He's on high, He's... <laughs> you and me, we're nothing! What are you, crazy? You think He cares about lowly nothings like us? Nothing! We're, we're nobodies, we're specks of dust, less than specks of dust. Of course God exists. Of course He's the Creator. That's why He's got nothing to do with us. But He's too busy. Therefore, we need intermediaries in between. We need to God a son. The son is powerful. He's one of his messengers, so to speak. The God of the ocean, the God, all these things are intermediaries between us and the almighty main God. Because he himself, <laughs> he's not going to set up an appointment for us. Right? The difference between us and them was, well, see, that's the thing. We don't need intermediaries. HaGadosh Baruch Hu, that's how powerful he is. The power that he has is, as powerful as he is, he could be with me. He is with me. If I want him to, he is with me. If you're going to say that he's not, he's too busy, right there, what are you doing? You're taking away power. You're limiting the Almighty God. He's no longer Almighty. Things like that put limitations on Hashem. So that same Ramvanisa, that same great God, he wants to attract with us. However, the Gemara says something. Very important. The Gemara says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, to a person that has Gava, a person that is haughty, a person that has no humility, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, me and that person cannot be in the same room. A person that feels too arrogant. Arrogance is something that truly kicks out the Shekhinah of Hashem. You want God to leave you completely alone? Be arrogant. The Gemara says that is one thing that Hashem says, you know what? Me and this guy, we're not going to get along. Why? Because if you think you're God, then you be it. Then you're God. I can't be your God if you're God. That's what arrogance is. What is arrogance? Arrogance truly is, if you really think about it deep down, you think you're God. That's why the Gemara also says, a person that acts through arrogance is what? Ke'ilu zara. It's like he worshipped idols. What does arrogance have to do with, with, with worshipping idols? Because you're worshipping yourself. You are your own idol. Anger is tied into the same thing. A person that gets angry is also like he worshipped idols. Why? Because you're worshipping yourself. Why do you get angry? You get angry for the simple reason that you're upset that Jonathan didn't speak to you nicely. How dare he call me buddy? Okay? I'm not his buddy. I'm a doctor now. Or as I was referred to at USC when I got my dental license, doctor. Remember when I was at USC one time for dental graduation, and I think the president of something is a Persian lady, actually at USC that she was giving out the what do they give it, the certificates or the diplomas, diplomas for diplomas. doctorate diplomas? She called every single person. <laughs> Listen. Whether you liked it or not, about 70% of them were Persian Jews from here. So it didn't really matter. Everyone understood where it's coming from. But it was the funniest thing hearing, going, Dr. Jonathan Simhai. Or like, Dr. It was like, it was fun to listen to. But <laughs> anyway, you think to yourself, I'm a doctor. Or I've heard people like, come to me and like, Rabbi, I have something really, I really got to talk to you about this. You know, me, me, I'm telling you, no joke, that's how the sentence started. Me, I'm an educated doctor of today's society, and I was very embarrassed to have someone so speak to me this way, and I'd like you to intervene. 
I'm telling you, my brain shut down <laughs> the moment the, se- the person said me. It really does. Why? Because it's like you're, all, you're, you're starting your case by saying, listen, when God speaks to you. Okay, Rabbi, I'm God. And I got my license of godlihood from USC. All right? And as God, I was very offended. That's all I heard. But if we feel, on the other hand, if we take it seriously and really feel, you know what? Not only am I not God, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not much. With everything that Hashem has given me all the time, I, 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 don't, I don't even, there's no way for me to repay Hashem. In, in, in comparison to God's greatness and His, and, and His tova and His goodness that He's bestowed upon me, I have nothing, I am nothing. If a person constantly feels like that, believe me, very little makes you angry. Very little will make you worried. Very little will get you offended. You'll rarely get offended. And believe me, the less a person gets offended in life, the happier life we have. It's like, you know, <laughs> some, some, somebody honks at you when you're driving. How mad do you get? Like, what? 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 The funniest thing to me is when the window is up and you see the guy drive by you and you're having a fight, you're actually screaming in your car with your window up, that person's window up. They can't hear you. So all you have to do really is just move your mouth really fast and they'll think you're screaming. But what do you do? You get so mad that this guy honked that you start screaming at yourself in your car. Have you ever noticed that? It's the craziest thing, right? So the first time I thought about this, I think someone brought this up to me. I was younger. First time I thought about this, now all I do is when people are, they have road rage, road rage next to me, and I want to have a little fun, all I do is with my window up, go, <laughs> and I see them go nuts, and I laugh, and I just drive away. It makes my day. It really does. To see, like, look, 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 look at what's happening, because I was driving a little slower than you, because I was like, you know, I'm not saying that I don't get frustrated while driving, but I'm telling you, if you keep telling yourself that, all these obstacles, all these things are a test, which we'll get to. Life becomes so much more easier and so much more relaxed. There's no need for screaming. Like, okay, you know what? Maybe that person's also having a bad time. You know, at times when I get frustrated behind the wheel, when I see like 405, for example, okay? Which is, uh, I've heard, it leads to hell. I've, I'm, <laughs> the 405 freeway in Los Angeles, it's either... A, a preparation for hell <laughs> or because when it's traffic on 405 you want uh, it's, it's crazy so I used to drive a lot on the 405 and I, I used to see up the hill sometimes when you're very far you could see the the top of the hill of the 405 I would see like literally the traffic was caused by like three cars going the same speed on three different lanes slowing Hundreds of cars for miles. And it makes you really upset. Like, dude, pull over and slowly, I don't know, whatever it is that's happening to you. But then what usually calmed me down was always thinking like, you know, you never know. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe it's an older person. Maybe, 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 maybe they're afraid of free. There's a lot of people that are very afraid to drive in the freeway. You know, you keep telling yourself these things and it really calms you down. You think to yourself, like, who am I? Why would I get upset at somebody else? Maybe if I was in their position, I would be doing the same exact thing. A lot of times it's happened to me. I'm driving somewhere, my mind is somewhere else, and I look and I'm going 30, and it's like a 70 mile an hour thing, and people get upset at me. I'm thinking to myself, look at me. If it was me right now, I would be raging. I would be going crazy behind the wheel. It's all perspective, right? And it all comes back to us, thinking I'm a somebody. And therefore, if that person in front of me is driving too slow, how dare they? Don't they know I'm God, doctor from USC? (laughs) They should know, right? But let's be honest. If we start counting all of our blessings, everything that Hashem has given us, all the greatness in our lives, we don't even 
begin to be able to even figure out how we could ever try to pay this back. So not only we, we're, not some, we're nothing, we're nobodies. We don't count. So who are we to feel like, oh, how dare that person talk to me like this? No. I learned from the Masilad Yesharim, uh, from the Orchot Sadiqim actually, that, you know, best way to get rid of your anger when someone um, verbally says something not so nice to you, someone calls you an idiot, you know, instead of lashing back right away, think to yourself, maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe I am. Never thought about it. I'll think about it. By the time you think about whether you're an idiot or not, you're not angry anymore. <laughs> you start like smiling like, <laughs> not an idiot, <laughs> but <laughs> you almost got me though. <laughs> that was a good one. I almost fell for it. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's all in, in the game of the Yitzhar Hara. Right? But, but it really trains a person to really understand where you, where, where you must be in life. I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. So, therefore, if we really, we truly want Hashem's presence in our lives, we have to understand that Hashem's presence can only be with us if we feel that we're low enough for His presence to be bestowed upon us. If we, on one hand, feel like gods ourselves, then there's no room for two gods. If I feel arrogant, if I feel that I'm too good, then Hashem says, then you be it. I'm, I can't be with you. If we want Hashem to be with us, we have to feel shfalut, we have to feel lowliness for Hashem's presence to be with us. You know, um, there was a great tzaddik, I forget who it was, one of the uh, great chachamim of the last generation. He was once in a synagogue, he was in a shul, I think he was traveling for Yamim and Narim for the high holidays. And he saw someone beforehand praying in that shul, and he really paid attention to this person a few times, and he saw, wow. This guy has such anivut, he has such humility, the way he prays, the way... So he went to the Gabbai and he said, may I ask you to please place my seat next to that person for the high holidays. I'd like to be sitting next to him. He wanted to kind of like, you know, kind of bask in that person's presence, to learn from him and pray like him. He's like, I want to be next to this guy. He's so anav, he's so humble. I want... So they give him that seat. And they're prayers start for Yom Imnoraim for the high holidays and he's you know sitting next to this guy and this guy really really is crying and he's 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 so he feels so lowly until all of a sudden they start giving out the brachot you know in Ashkenazic synagogues if you've ever been to them um, uh, it's very different you know in Sephardic synagogues most Sephardic synagogues you either are auctioning the aliyot when there's things to be auctioned you're either auctioning it there or you've auctioned it before but Ashkenazic synagogues, most synagogues don't do that. They're given by, you know, who's got, you know, a yard site or something. Or sometimes it's even just by, by, by turn, they give those kibudim, the, those honors to different people. And this person wanted one of the aliyot, one of the uh, brachot or whatever it was. And someone else in the synagogue was given that bracha. And he got so mad, he got so upset, and he started giving it to the Gabbai. Like, how dare you give it to this person? What are you doing? It should have been me, you should have been giving it to me. Huh? This rabbi sitting there going, what, what is going on right now? Is this the same guy that was like, literally kneeling before God? He was crying, and it comes to the Aliyot, and it's a different person. Like, how, why did you give this blessing to that person? It should have been me. It takes five minutes for them to fight. Finally, the rabbi goes up to him and says, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to ask you. You know, I've been watching you. You're so anav. When the way you pray to Hashem, the way you, you, you handled yourself before God, it was, I was inspired by you. And then it comes to the aliyot, and that other person, your friend, gets the brachot, and you're, you're going nuts on him why he got the honor and you didn't. So he says, Rabbi, of course. Before God, I am nothing. But before that nothing, I'm something. That's not true humility. True humility is actually being humble. Feeling like, yes, before God, God, you're the Almighty. Nah, nah, nah. And then when it comes to other people, like, hey, listen. Understand who you're talking to. Do you know how well I pray in synagogue and how connected I am to God? I'm like a God by myself. 
You know, that's not true humility. Tzadikim are told that a righteous person does their mitzvot, even the good deeds, in private. So no one sees. Right? You think the Chafetz Chaim, all these Gedole Hador, all these great per- people of the generations, you think they flaunted all the miracles that they made happen? No way. They used to give blessings all the time. They used to give guarantees to people of things they wanted and it would come true. And afterwards they would go to them and say, Oh, Chacham, you know, you gave me a blessing for this and that, it came true. They'd be like, No, it wasn't me. See, what I did was I inspired you to pray and because of your own prayers, the blessings came true. Everybody knew that it was really him. But that's really what a righteous person is. Never taking credit for anything. Now, you ask yourself one question. How is that, how how is it possible to at the same time be so great, yet be humble? How do these two ever go together? How is it possible to go together? You're, You're great. But you're supposed to walk around and be like, oh, I'm nothing, Khoda, you know, I'm a nobody. What? What USC? What? <laughs> I don't know why I'm stuck on USC tonight. Okay, UCLA it is. Some UCLA fans are getting a little offended over here. And some of you are getting offended because you're from Harvard. Like what? <laughs> so how are we supposed how do these things work together? I'll give you a prime example. Who do we know that if I if if I ask you, who do we know that is truly anav, truly truly humble? Which personality comes to mind? Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Moses. Why? Because the Torah itself attests to it. The Torah says Moshe Rabbeinu aya anav mikol adam al pnei adamah. Moshe Rabbeinu was the most humble person on earth. Right? He was the most humble person that ever lived. At the end of the Torah it says, Velo kam navi od ke Moshe. There will never ever be another prophet like Moshe. Do you know what it means for God to say that? It's like God saying, I broke the mold. Moshe Rabbeinu was one of a kind, never will be again like Moshe Rabbeinu. Asher, uh, that, that would speak to God panim el panim, face to face. So now, let me ask you something. But it still says, Moshe Rabbeinu was Anav Mikol Adam. He was the most humble person that ever lived. How does that work? How, how could you be the greatest person that ever lived? You know what it means for God to actually say, you're the greatest. God says you're the greatest, you're the greatest. That's it. It's done. Signed by God, stamp. So if you're that great and you know it, and God is telling you, how do you, and you're humble, the most humble person that ever lived? I'll make it one better. Rav Lazarus said this to me in, in, in Israel. He said, you know how we know Moshe Rabbeinu was truly, truly anav? Because the passage that I just read for you, Moshe Aya anav me'od mikon adam, Aish Moshe. He was the most humble person that ever lived. Who wrote that? Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it, right? God dictated and Moses wrote. Moshe Rabbeinu wrote himself and Moses was the most humble person that ever lived. Imagine. How humble do you have to be to actually write that you're humble and for that statement to still be true. To actually be like, what God? Yes, I'm the greatest man that ever lived and still actually it be true. That it didn't go to your head. How do you do that? Do we, do we actually want to say that Moshe Rabbeinu walked around all day going, I'm no, I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody. What USC, what UCLA, what Harvard, no, Pili, no, I'm a nothing. It's like, <laughs> you know, you think Moshe Rabbeinu, that's, you think that was Moshe Rabbeinu's life? I guarantee you it wasn't. Know this. Moshe Rabbeinu was great because he knew he was Moshe. You think Moshe didn't know he was the greatest prophet that ever lived? He spoke to God face to face. You think he didn't know it? You think if someone would come to Moshe and go like, Nah, Moshe Rabbeinu, you're right, you're right, I am, I'm a not. No, Moshe Rabbeinu knew he was great. One time it said, Rav, Rav, um, 
Rabbi Albaum said, about the Chazonish, that one time someone was talking about, to Chazonish about, Chazonish about greatness and stuff. The Chazonish said, you think I don't know? Chazonish, by the way, was one of the greatest uh, Torah codifiers of the last generation. He said, you think I don't know I'm the Chazonish? I know who I am. I know. People are knocking down my door to come and get brachot from me. Trust me, I know who I am. You think Rabbi Vadi Yosef never knew who he was? That he was the greatest, uh, uh, you know, halachic posek of our generation? You think, you think Rabbi Moshe Feinstein didn't know? If they didn't know how great they were, they could not have given so much to humanity. They knew how very great they were. So what, how were they still humble? One key factor is that they understood. Everything that I have is not from me. It's from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Everything that I have is from God. I have nothing of my own. So I am great, but that greatness is not mine. And compared to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, compared to what I can be or I could have been, it's still nothing. Compared to what I can give back, it's still nothing. They say that the Chafetz Chaim was once on a, on a train. And he had a stop in a city. And all the people from the city... Um, uh, knew that he has, Rav Chavetz Chaim has this stop. And they all wanted to come just get a glimpse of his face. This is Chavetz Chaim, in his train, as the train has stopped in that station, and it's going to go to the next station, right? And he was, I forget, with, um, he was with one of the other Chachamim of the generation. I forget who he was. I'm sorry. Um, so the Chavetz Chaim decides he's going to hide his face. And he didn't want, you know, you don't want to take the credit for it, so to speak. Like all oh, these people are coming out out of town to the train station just to see me. He didn't feel. He didn't want the cover. He didn't want the respect. So the rav, the other rav that was with him, asks him. He says, "Why? Why don't you want to come and have the people see you?" He says, "Listen, I don't. I don't want to take the credit. I don't want the cover. I don't want the respect. I don't want the honor because, uh, you know, if 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 I benefit from that honor, it's going to take away." From my zechuyot, from my from my merits, I don't want to take away. I don't want to get honor for who I am. I I, I don't I don't want to do that. So he says to him, "Let me tell you something. If it means you losing merit by making another Jew happy, then so be it." Chavetz Chaim says, "Sold. Makes sense. That's who he was." That just showed that he was never even going to get honor. He would never benefit from the honor. The fact that he heard that he said, oh, I can make another Jew happy even if it's going to take away from my zechut, from my merits. Yeah, yeah, it's worth it. You know what that says? That says he already realized and recognized. He always knew that whatever he has is not from his own anyway. Everything he has in order is in order to give to other Jews, to help other people. So if it means helping other people because they like to see me, so be it. That's gadlut. That's greatness. That's greatness. You know, one of my rabbin was telling me one time, he, he walked into Rabbi Vadi Yosef's office with a couple that needed help with something. And Rabbi Vadi stood up from his chair when, when the rabbi walked in. Do you understand what it means? For the one of the greatest Tamil in the world to stand up for you. Why? Because you understood. Listen, I learned Torah, that person also learns Torah. He also has some greatness in him. I'm not standing up because of him, I'm standing up for, for the knowledge that he has. That's greatness. Now, if you're not great, and if you're full of air, what are you gonna say? I'm going to stand up for him? <laughs> Compared to God, I'm a nobody. Compared to him, come on. Seriously? Right there. It's over. Turn the page, begin again. You know, there's a famous um, story that a, uh, a chassid goes to a rebbe. And he says, rebbe, you know, there's a famous telling that... that um, as long as you run after honor, honor runs away from you. But if you run away from honor, you shall receive honor. That's the, that's the rule. The rule is, if you're constantly looking for honor, you'll never get honor. But if you run away from honor, if you always keep yourself away from getting honor, then you will become honorable. 
So as Chassid tells the, the, the Rebbe, he says, I'm always running away from honor. I never take any credit for anything. But I'm never honored. No one even recognizes me. Oh! I don't know if he said that last part. I'm not sure. That might be added. <laughs> but I'm never receiving honor. So the Rebbe turns to me and says, you know why you never receive any honor? It's because as you're running away from honor, you're always turning back to see where honor is. Is it catching up to you or not? If you're constantly running away from honor, looking back to see if it's coming along, is it there yet? Is it about to catch up to you? It's never going to catch up to you. That's cheating. Running away from honor means actually running away from honor. Really recognizing that I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. And I'm telling you, don't look at me like, oh, you know what? Yeah, we should do It's very hard. What we're talking about is difficult, but it's very doable. All it takes is some inner thing thinking and inner thought and inner concentration on who am I? It's called meditation. It's something that for thousands of years Jews have been doing, hitpodedut, which today is called meditation. But for thousands of years Jews have been doing it. Every Jew should do hitpodedut at least once a week. Really sit down and think, where am I? Who am I? What have I done? What things am I proud of? What things am I not proud of? Have a little diary. Write things down daily. Here are the things that I'm not so proud of that I did today. Here are the things that I'm proud of that I did today. Here are the things that I want to fix. Here are the things that I look into the future and doing. That's called Hidbodidut. It really opens the person's mind and heart to becoming better every single day. And Bezrat Hashem will follow up next week. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.